we will go ahead and uh, convene the meeting. Uh, and according to my handy dandy electronic device, it's 2.33. So we'll adjourn, or we'll convene the meeting at 2.33 p.m. And we'll do introductions first. But uh, why don't we start over here with Crystal? Hi, Crystal Coerts, Institutional Effectiveness. Hi, I'm Stephanie Fleming. I'm from, uh, I'm a speech faculty. Joe Simon Eschew with Business Services. AC Pinellan, speech faculty. John Wood, Management Association. David LeClaire, Management Association, Financial Management. Charmant City Business Services. Annie Ammon, Faculty Association. No, sorry, I'm from Academic Center. That's right, representing Academic Center. Bob Bell, Academic and Student Affairs. Julie Kiyos, Academic Center. Bob Miller, Business and College Services, and we're going to go around the room and we've got some guests here. Hi, I'm Sarah Mojica. I'm a student here at PCC. Good. Welcome. Mary Thompson. Mary Thompson. Right. Mary Thompson. <laughs> Mary Thompson. <laughs> David Hewitt, Department. our Engineering and Technology, formerly known as. Got it. And Dan. Okay. Uh, Dan Haley. In the library. Rod Foster, Visual Studies. Jeff Wojcik, filling in for Cal Robinson. Mm -hmm. Classified Senate. Jessica Garcia with the PCC Courier. Welcome, Jessica. Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, I think we, we don't have a, quite a quorum, I do not think, so we're not going to be voting anything in particular, so I think we can go ahead and, and go forward in that regard. So let's talk. look at the minutes of uh, the regular meeting of Thursday, January 23rd, and the chair will entertain a motion. Anybody care to make a motion? My Alzheimer's doesn't go that far back. Is that a condition? Can you remember that far? What's that? Can you remember that far? Let me try to get January 23rd. I'm happy to move to accept the minutes. Thank you. Do I have a second? I second. Thank you, John. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? I know. I can move to vote on it, yeah, but I'm going to abstain from the vote. So. All those um, in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? I abstain. Opposed? Uh, abstention. One abstention. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to delay item 4A, allowing uh, Mary Erin Crook to finish her class and join us. So uh, we'll be happy to do that. So we're going to move to item 4B, which is integrated planning. Matthew's out of town, but he has uh, great substitutes in Stephanie and uh, Crystal. So Hi. You, thank you. Thank you very much um, for having us today. So we wanted to uh, talk to Brack a little bit more about integrated planning. The last time that Matt and I were here and we were covering some of the items that we were focusing on for accreditation, integrated planning was one of the major um, areas that we were focusing on. So we wanted to have kind of an update for you about where we are in terms of integrated planning. Uh, so just as a, a quick kind of reminder so that we're all on the same page about what we're talking about with integrated planning. Integrated planning is that idea that we start with the concept of evaluation. Um, evaluation is where we examine like student achievement and student learning. Um, and here at PCC, that resides in program review for us or unit review, depending on where it is in the college that you work. or. Um, and then that moves into an idea that you take that evaluation and you turn it into your improvement goals. Uh, improvement goals is part of that planning process. And then it moves into this idea where we allocate resources, um, so resource allocation. So integrated planning is this, you know, the circular cycle where everything is integrated, that we start with the concept of evaluation, we can clearly link that to our planning agenda items, and then we can clearly link that to our resource allocation process. Do you want it? I think you did that brilliant. Oh, well, thank yeah, you very much. Oh, <laughs> Which, brings <laughs> <laughs> Which brings us to um, the fact that ACCJC tells us that program review or evaluation is really what they tell us, but program review and planning should inform and direct resource allocation. Okay, so they tell us that that needs to happen, that that's the best practice. 
Um, to be a little bit more specific about that, from the guide to evaluating institutions from ACC, JC, they kind of give us a little bit more of some guidelines about that. But more specifically, they want to see that the planning cycle begins with evaluation of student needs in college programs and services. And that's something we actually, we can't just say we're doing it, we have to actually document it and show that that's happening at our college. Um, that this evaluation in turn informs college decisions uh, about where we need to improve, um, that we're clearly identifying those improvement goals college-wide, and that resources are ultimately distributed uh, to help us actually achieve those self-identified improvement goals. So uh, part of what we have to do is we have to evaluate our existing structure. You know, ACCJC wants to see that we're doing that. Plus, it's a best practice. We want to make sure that we're evaluating what's happening here at our college. And so in order to do that, we've hosted two different what we call the integrated planning study sessions. So we had a study session in spring of 2013 and a follow-up to that in fall of 2013. Uh, we, this, these particular study sessions were members of BRAC. Many of you participated in those study sessions, thank you. Uh, members of Planning and Priorities and members of the Institutional Effectiveness Committee and then we also had members of the Academic Senate join us. Um, at the spring 2013, the first study session, uh, we discussed the basics of integrated planning, so that nice one slide that we did here was an hour there, so we went into a lot more detail about it. Uh, we examined the accreditation requirements to make sure that, you know, so we could evaluate our model, you know, knowing that we need to do what's, what we're being asked to do. Uh, that we looked at the committee roles on all of those different committees. So we talked a lot about what the role of the committees are, what the mission of the committees are, um, and then we identified areas of improvement we'll get to in just a second. And then the follow-up, uh, we kind of focused in a little bit more an evaluation of our existing model, and then we looked at a possible sample model that was built from the recommendations that came out of the first study session. Uh, the only thing I was going to say is I think sometimes we get confused what accreditation says about evaluation, and they say we have to do systematic evaluation, but they don't say what that's supposed to be. They don't say you have to survey all your people, you don't have to do focus groups. They don't tell us how to do it, they just say that we need to do it. So I found this to be a really good way for us to do evaluation because it created a dialogue in the room that we previously had not been having. And I found it very informative. And we had really uh, good attendance mm -hmm. to both of these study sessions, which was really nice. So there was uh, a wide uh, participation. So from study session number one, the, the broad recommendations that came out of that were that um, people, or we, the people at the, at the, the study sessions weren't clear about the current processes and that um, they identified an overall communication problem. Um, that we need more access to the information that's related to integrated planning and that we need to work to sync the timelines of the processes for program review planning and resource allocation on an annual cycle. Uh, we came very specific um, ways that we could improve. This came from the actual study session. Uh, folks asked that we articulate the process for IEC recommendations to be considered for inclusion into the EMP. Uh, that we make all constituents aware of our integrated planning model, which I have to tell you that making everybody aware of the integrated planning model, so colleges that have been put on some type of sanction because of integrated planning, a lot of what they do, that first step is to create this visual, to show that they have this visual. And there's these very pretty graphs that they've created. And man, they go to some major lengths for everyone to know it. Um, one school, Cuesta, that was put on show cause, everyone had to wear a t-shirt or a hat that had their integrated planning model on it. I'm not a big fan of um, dressing alike, so I would really like if we could not get to that point. Um, it was really intense. It was really intense, like what they did, um, you know. And it had a matching button. Matching buttons. So you had to wear the shirt. And Someone had a button, button. yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was intense. So, um, Next one was to develop a consistent tracking system to ensure that the IEC recommendations are enacted, which is actually happening, but obviously the feedback was that the people in the room didn't know about it. Um, develop a rubric for resource allocation that aligns with the PCC mission, EMP, annual college goals, and other criteria determined by BRAC. Clear roles and processes for all of the committees. So we got in a room and a lot of people didn't know what all of the committees did, you know, how they related to one another. 
um, to align the timelines for program review planning and resource allocation with the budget cycle, uh, and to make sure that our existing model captures the needs that are common to multiple programs. Well, actually, that was the reflection, that it, but it doesn't capture individual program needs. Um, you know, so we were looking at a lot of the recommendations are broad-based rather than program-specific. Which brought us to study session number two, which we identified that uh, we needed to focus on this idea that there's a lack of communication and collaboration between the committees. Uh, we need to focus on the timelines and overall processes so that they're more clear. And ultimately, um, the folks in the room communicated that we have that we lack an efficient, transparent, and easily understandable process. You want to go back to that one? Well, it's really funny. I did Skyline site visit for accreditation, and um, we went to their BRAC meeting. They explained their planning process, their integrated planning process to it. We didn't understand it. We had their dean of research come in and explain it to us. This is the entire site team. We didn't understand it. We had their VP of administrative service come in and explain it to us. We still didn't understand it. And finally, we concluded we were never going to understand it, but they understood it. <laughs> and we let it go. And that's all it they all said the same thing. They all explained it the exact same way. We never understood it. The entire site team, we never got it. But we decided they could explain it and they could talk to it. We were good. <laughs> I, we didn't know what else to do. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings us, oh, that's a small font. I'm sorry. Which brings us to the how can we improve. Wow. Um, oh, we're getting ready to test my eyes. Okay, so create a, a system or a wedge web page for tracking the IEC broad recommendations. So this idea that those recommendations exist, but we need to communicate them more clearly. Um, make the information available at having cross-membership. Oh yeah, this was an idea. So that perhaps there's, a, there's no communication between the IEC, PMP, and BRAC. And that's something we need to address. And one of the possibilities was having some cross-membership. Uh, develop a clear timeline, increase awareness, uh, create that clear visual that we're talking about. Uh, go beyond compliance and this was a large focus of study session number two this idea that yeah we're told that we need to have this but obviously it's a best practice and so we want to go beyond compliance to make it meaningful for us what's the IEC? institutional effectiveness uh, that they wanted the the program review recommendations published again I just sorry I took this verbatim I didn't want to edit out people's comments um, rubric for resource allocation allocation with clear criteria so this idea of what the criterion are for when you're requesting some type of resource um, allocation um, that we need to create a process where BRAC makes resource allocation decisions um, but they do so with input from the IEC and the PMP uh, we increase overall transparency, and then we increase communication again with BRAC, IEC, and PMP. So you can see some of the trends. Uh, increase communication? Efficient. Communication, transparency? collaboration, okay. increased efficiency, increased transparency. And make a clear process. <laughs> <laughs> and set priorities and needs. There you go. Clearly. Clearly. <laughs> Very clearly. Um, so one of the things that we did, do you want to talk about this as we presented a sample sure. model? Um, what we tried to do is that, okay, what are all the key things that we talked about and everybody mentioned, and how do we actually put that into sort of a timeline that people could sort of maybe possibly visually follow and we could explain? Whether anybody else understood, obviously doesn't matter, just as long as we could explain it. So these are the bodies we felt should be included in the process. And so we started thinking in terms of June 30th with the IEC broad recommendations, the program reviews finalized, feedback got all done, September 1st, area plans and board goals are established. Percent by October 1st, school plans, draft one, the unit plans are written. And the unit plans and the school plans would be built based on the area plans and the board goals. November 1st, we'd have the school plans final draft and the department plans would be starting to be developed. By November 30th, we'd have the prioritization done, departments identify their needs, school days work with committees to prioritize those needs. January 30th, BRAC, resource requests including non-faculty hires we brought, PMP would look at the EMP updates, and CAPM would look at faculty hires. Leading that all, and then senior leadership would take the BRAC recommendations with them, would lead us to February 1st, where we'd go to college council, and College Council would then make their recommendations to the President and the Board of Trustees. There you go. It's a model. We evaluated that model. 
So it was just a sample model that was built based on the recommendations from the first study session to kind of get us started. Um, this was some of the feedback that came from that evaluation of the sample model. Uh, so there was a lot of questions about the, the timeline. And this was really good. They brought up some very good things about, you know, sometimes there are those things that need to be addressed faster. Can we put in some sort of an emergency model in place for funding if that needs to happen? We thought that was an excellent idea because it's true, sometimes you can't wait a whole year. So how can we address those issues? The timeline, we need to contextualize it by other dates, the academic calendar, make sure everything's working together. We don't have large groups of people, you know, not here at the times that we're doing significant amount of planning or public review. Should college council um, be before senior leadership? We talked about that. Should college council recommend to the board or should they recommend to senior leadership? How should we uh, create that flow? or be the last group to facilitate. Uh, we need to go back and forth communication between senior leadership and BRAC. So do we need to re-put BRAC in this process somewhere as well so BRAC knows what's happening to the allocation request? And then consider representation of all constituent groups throughout the process. Which brings us to next steps. So there, yeah, we need to move on. And it's kind of fun again. It looked really big on my computer screen in my office. I'm sorry. Um, uh, so these are the next steps that the study sessions were kind of requesting. Uh, one, that we need to develop those resource allocation rubrics. Uh, that we distinguish ongoing resource allocation requests for one-time funding. And I'll talk about that for a second. We sometimes forget that there is a difference between I want to buy a desk, which is one-time fund funding, or I want to hire an administrative assistant, which would be ongoing funding. So we make sure we're not just saying, okay, you need $10,000. Well, you might need $10,000 right now, but you're going to need $20,000 continuing on down the road. And making sure that people really understand the differences between those types of requests. Uh, that we need to get feedback from those major committees, which is one of the reasons why we're here. Um, is we want to try to get feedback from this body because you play such an important role in the integrated planning um, process. And that we need to find a way to make these conversations public so that the college can be informed, the college community can be informed. Uh, committees need to start having conversations about their roles in the larger process. That was a large focus of both of the study sessions, is the members of each one of these committees was like, where do we fall into this process? What are our responsibilities? What should they be? Uh, do we you know, somehow need to change the roles of the committees to make things more effective or not? Those are a lot of the conversations. Uh, after we left this particular study session, there was kind of a general consensus, um, and there are some people here who were there, correct me if I'm wrong, but there was this idea that we needed to kind of a focus group that had members from all of the different committees to come together to start the actual work um, to, to implement some of the recommended changes that came out from these two study sessions, or to work with the committees, you know, to start to implement some of these changes. You want to take over? You good? Uh, I thought you did that really well, but we also think that uh, to address some of those issues regarding transparency and communication, we need to in put into place some standing reports from each of these committees that are made to the Acad Academic Senate, the Classified Senate, and the Associated Students so that we are all communicating with, e with each other effectively. We talked about the possibility of having like, and we used to, but maybe a better central landing site, website somewhere where all this information is set and stored that we can easily refer people to when they, when they have questions about what's going on and a place to post these standing reports. We definitely want to talk about BRAC's role and the representation needs to be clarified in, your, in what you're doing this. We really think that BRAC should be working to build a rubric that we use to address resource allocation requests. Uh, we need to close the loops back to the IEC on funding decisions. IEC is making funding recommendations. How are we getting back to each other and saying here's what happened? How do we close the loop on those processes? Board recommendations, broad recommendations, oh, that's a tiny little print, it's pretty good. Broad recommendations from the IEC should be disseminated to all the other bodies. And you should know what the IEC is doing. P&P should know what the IEC is doing. College Council should know what their broad recommendations are. That would be very helpful information and people would, I think, feel more informed and there would be a communication flow. And then clarify how all constituents in different areas, programs, departments fit into this process. Not sure we'd ever really do that, but we would certainly like to try. 
So, which brings us back to this committee. Um, so we wanted to share with you what happened at those study sessions, uh, what the recommendations were that came out of the study sessions, and to also kind of put it on your radar of what some of the recommendations were that were specific to this particular body, um, as well as moving forward to this idea of creating this focus group um, and you know what that representation on the focus group would look like, what the participation from this committee would be, or the representation, you know, the representatives from this committee would look like to move forward to make some of the um, necessary improvements. I think that's our last slide. That is our last slide, okay. so if there's any okay. questions, we can always address that so, too. So, one of the things that I just sent an email to myself about, and to Cindy, is to uh, get you and Crystal and, and Matt and me and Joe and maybe another person or two from this committee, if you like, into a room soon to figure out the specifics of what it is that we need, that, that BRAC's role is going to be in this whole process. So that, as Joe, for example, is creating a lot of budget, new budget processes right now. And we need to make sure that they all obviously align together. So. I actually, when we built that process, we used Joe's model. I went to Joe, I got I his, it and, I, and, I, and I just took his model and backtracked it through based on what he said. So it we were familiar to me too. Yeah, that we said, Can you go yeah. back to that slide? We, we tried to use oh. what he had and, um, and try to just reverse want. engineer it. If Joe says that the budget process begins on February 1st, how do we reverse that all the way back through down to the IEC RAW recommendations? Good. And this is the way okay. we did it. Good. Mm -hmm. So we started with. We're yeah. still going to have the meeting anyway. Yes. It's fine. But uh, we started with Joe. Okay, good. Um, I, okay, that. that, that you feel better? I feel a little better. <laughs> uh, because what I see, well, first of all, personally, I want to say thank you to Stephanie and to you and Matt and, and others who put this together and all the work they're doing. because. Having been the one who struggled through the last accreditation process, we didn't have anything near like this to show. So now it's a question of taking that process, getting it to where, to what's manageable and we all agree is manageable, and then implementing over the next few years as we, as we transition from the way we do business now to the way we're going to do business. And that's going to be probably a two or three year learning cycle. I, I, does everybody agree and some other managers in the room here? It's going to take some time. So, Penel. Um, So based on this model, I think I really, what I noticed towards the end is that there needs to be more cl a clear process. <laughs> right, that's the last three slides. So what I'm thinking of, and for those of you who've worked with me before, I used to like, get really hung up on the logistics, like when do I need to get this done and how do we start to move forward from here? So my question is, is that it sounds like based on this strategic plan, we should be shooting as a committee to probably be getting our rubric ready for June 30th, is that what would be the recommendation from the folks who've been working on this process? Are you talking about BRAC's rubric? BRAC. Well, BRAC's rubric, if I read this, really doesn't come into play until January 30th, which was when they'd be reviewing requests. Mm -hmm. But we would need to have, I would say we would have to have that draft started soon. So, oh, so maybe that goes to my second question. So the this, this smaller committee needs to, yeah. to meet to work on that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to have it for us by June 30th, I think that really helps the process and gives yeah. people more understanding. But right. Well, that's why I'm asking because, short. right, like from a, like in my moment, like from a faculty perspective, right, like you usually lay out what you're going to get graded on by before June the assignment. Well, okay. by the, before the assignment, right? Like, so this is that moment if our rubric is kind of the assignment that we're working backwards from seems like that would need to be integrated into the IEC process. Yeah, and, Am I right? and also too, like we were trying to simplify this so it could be on one page. Uh -huh. Obviously each one of these steps needs to have its own yes. like details. Yeah, you just can't put it on like we just can't throw one, spaghetti yeah, at the wall. Yeah, because then it gets it. crazy. Yeah. And and no, you know, we may have to tattoo this onto our bodies. So mm -hmm. um, as we learn it oh, and no. memorize it. I'm totally kidding. But um, <laughs> but 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 yeah the idea is it's like let's t shirts right right. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> So, um, so we better love it. But the idea is, is like, let's say this was on the website, okay? If you hover over June 30th, you could click on it, and it would break out yeah, the, the steps. steps. Okay. But we need to get this solidified first, and then we can go into the detail on each one of those steps. And, and we're not saying that this is exactly the way it has to be. We just were trying to put something in a format that people could comment on and think about. Mm -hmm. There might be a different order for this to happen. We just had to, we just tried to work back from Joe's February first date and see what we could come up with. 
No, no, no. I appreciate that because it does. I think allows us on the committee to decide what our work is as we're moving forward. So I appreciate that this is a starting point. Okay. This is this is very good. Okay, so I'll schedule that meeting. Does anybody <coughs> other than Joe and I, just volunteer Joe, um, want to join us in that discussion with uh, Stephanie and Matt and Crystal? Canella, that'd be great. Really? Thank you. That'd be very helpful. Anybody else? We're really fun. Best <laughs> people. <laughs> yay! Yay! Very okay. good. Extra large for the okay. t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Covered. So make a note, please, of which the uh, Dave, Dave, and uh, and Canella. That'd be great. Okay. So we'll we'll do that. Um, now I imagine you guys are gone next week, right? <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So it'd be the week after is when we're going to figure out how to do this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Thank you all very much. Is there anything else? Uh, any other questions for Stephanie and uh, Crystal? I appreciate it. And we all want to um, congratulate Crystal Carras. Oh, thank you. Who is now our, our, our full-time permanent, no doubt about it, Director of Institutional uh, Effectiveness. And appreciate we congratulate you for running the gauntlet. Thank you. And being successful. So thank you for all you do for us. Okay, so we'll move uh, the agenda back to. Uh, Danny, can you get the lights for me, please? The, thank you. <coughs> the topic of, uh, of reassigned time, and uh, let me kind of set the stage for this a little bit, and then uh, <coughs> Joe's got a, uh, the actual numbers and the presentation and the, and the information, and then Dr. Bell is going to be uh, providing some information as well, and then we can get into a discussion. Um, the topic of reassigned time is one that has uh, been around for uh, uh, at least the last three years that I, that I recall. Um, during the time that we are going through some very difficult uh, budget uh, uh, challenges, uh, Dr. Bell and I met with uh, uh, President Martinez, Ed Martinez, who was the president of the Academic Senate at the time, and we had discussions about what might we do in order to try and, and relieve some of the budget burdens. So even at that time, uh, Dr. Bell and I and Ed and at least one or two others, I believe, um, uh, discussed the reassigned time issue. I think Dan is here or was here. Uh, Dan was on uh, the cabinet with uh, Ed, Ed Martinez at the time, and I believe it was discussed at length at their, uh, uh, at their leadership meetings. And I'm not sure if it ever got to the academics on the floor or not, but it was discussed there. Uh, there were maybe a couple of adjustments made, Dr. Bell, from that, maybe not, but I don't recall that we ever actually pulled the trigger on anything we, we for that make, year. We didn't make any major adjustments right. on that. Got it. So, um, recently, um, uh, Chris Pallone, uh, who, was Chris here? Was Chris here? She's gone. She's gone. Recently, Chris Pallone made a request uh, to uh, Dr. Bell uh, myself and I believe Dr. Rocha and said we she would like to have a list of all the reassigned time. She and others uh, were concerned about the number of full-time faculty who had released time and the impact that that had on the institution. She had other concerns about how folks were selected for release time assignments and things like that. Uh, we did not have the current data. We had data that went oh, hi Mary. I'm sorry. Let's see. Let's see. We had data that, uh, uh, or information that was like, was three years old, basically. And so we asked for more time to pull that all, all of that together. Uh, and then we indicated that uh, we felt, from a shared governance point of view, that it would be appropriate to, to first present that data to BRAC. Then, of course, it becomes public, because uh, this is a Brown Act committee, and, uh, and, and we will provide the information. Everybody will post it on. Um, the website uh, for BRAC and what have you after today's meeting. So, so today we are here to present to you the work that uh, Dr. Bell and I and Joe have done to, uh, well, HR, I should say, HR first started it, uh, the work and then uh, Dr. Bell and Joe and I got together uh, to present the information. And I, I'll say to you that in general, uh, it's cost the district roughly $3 million a year is what the release time costs. There are currently 77 or so faculty who have some percentage of release time. Of that 3 million, and Joe will correct me here, but I think we've got roughly six or 700,000 of that is uh, what we call a fund three or, or restricted grant, grant funded release time. And the balance of it is, uh, is district release time for a variety of, uh, of, of, of issues. 
so a part of what Joe is going to show you is um, those numbers. He's also going to show you where uh, uh, some thought might be to, to, uh, to um, uh, reduce, uh, if that were the pleasure of, um, of the institution. Uh, but it's only ideas generated um, uh, from things that we know about how the operation functions right now. So with that little preview, I'll now ask Joe to kind of go through the presentation, and then when he's done, um, we will uh, ask Dr. Bell to uh, do his. Okay, so I'll wait until it goes around, but uh, it is a six-page report. It's reflecting the historical information from fall 2013 uh, and for spring of 2014. Um, so what we have under the yellow column is the historical information for fall 2013, and what we have under the blue column is the um, fall 2014 adjustments to be considered of the faculty that are listed under fall 2013. So side-by-side -side comparison from one fall to the next, it does give the uh, uh, employee's name, it gives the percentage of the reassigned time, it gives the cost of the reassigned time, and it, and it actually does break it down between the funding source, whether it's unrestricted funds, Fund 01, or uh, restricted funds, Fund 3. So the first three pages are the comparison of fall. You will see on page two there are some uh, pink boxes to your right. That's just a, a running total of the adjustments for consideration. And that is copied onto page three, so there's a side-by-side -side comparison of the historical information and the information for consideration. So on page three, we have a breakdown for fall 2013. The total <coughs> FTEs for uh, reassigned time was approximately 33 full-time employees. It cost us, page three, it cost us in total 1.468 million. Fund one was about 1.2 million, and fund three was about 300,000. The comparison from fall 13 to the um, fall 14 adjustments for consideration is going from 33 full-time employees down to 21 full-time employees, and a savings of um, $523,000. So we're going from 1.5 million to a savings of about 522, so approximately a million dollar savings uh, for the semester. And, and, and the savings, uh, obviously, is these faculty uh, would go back into the classroom and teach, and not every one of these faculty are teaching faculty. Some of them are counselors, and but, but the vast majority are. So uh, <coughs> what that means is the savings comes from the fact that we would not be paying for adjunct faculty or perhaps overload to full-time faculty to take the place of the faculty that are not teaching their full load. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. So then the second page, I'm sorry, the second group of reports, so page th four through six, is the same thing but it's the reflection of spring 2014 and then spring 2015 and the adjustments for consideration. So it's the same information. It's the uh, name of the employee, the amount of reassigned time, and the cost of that reassigned time in comparison to 2015. If you go down to the next page, page five of six, you will see a comparison of the historical information to the proposed adjustment for consideration of going from 34 full-time employees down to 20 full-time employees. If you turn the page again, so page six of six, again, it's the side-by-side -side comparison at the bottom of the page. So in spring 2014, we are spending approximately $1.5 million. 1.4, give or take, is from fund one, and 180,000 is from fund three. With the adjustments for consideration, we are saving a total of 610,000 with um, savings in fund one of 540 and fund three of 140,000. Again, the comparison, 34, 000, uh, sorry, 34 full-time employees would be adjusted down to 20 full-time employees. And the total savings for fiscal year 14-15 would be one point, a little more than $1.1 million. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, certainly on the fund three, because it's uh, restricted dollars, uh, there are things to consider as to whether or not we would, we would do that uh, or not. Um, 
the grant is there for a reason, it's funding for a reason, uh, but even so there are ways in which to maybe uh, provide that that would still result in some kind of savings or, and put that faculty member back into the classroom. So any questions for Joe before we hand this over to Dr. Bell for his comments? Is there, is there any way that, I, I really appreciate all this work, it's very helpful and interesting. Um, is there any way you could go back any further to say 2010 and give us a history from 2010 because I be really there. I would be that. reluctant to do that because this isn't information that is in one source. We actually took a very long period of time putting it together. Um, only for because of the staffing hours it takes to put it together, I would be reluctant to do so. But it would be very, very difficult. Uh, Mariel? Well, and I think to follow up on what Danny's asking about in the adopted budget for 2012-13 to 13-14, um, there was a dramatic increase in reassigned time. It was 48.9%. And so I'm wondering a couple of things. I think that's why you're probably asking this question, Danny. But, um, you know, I know in my house, if I increased some budget area, like, you know, my car savings or my vacation savings. If I had a 50% increase in that, I'd have a plan for why I was going to use that, what I was going to use that money for. So I'm wondering why the school increased that money well, so much. What I, was I, the purpose of that? I, I can't be specific in terms of your answer, but I can speculate <coughs> that the SASI monies, the, 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 the district uh, started um, now maybe two years ago. Uh, sort of putting a million dollars a year aside for, this, for the uh, Student Access and Success Initiative, mm -hmm. other, otherwise known as SASI. <coughs> so that was a number of, of uh, in-house funded uh, innovation projects for things like Pathways, uh, the Math uh, uh, Re-Curriculum Project, the Redesign Project, I think they call it s uh, SLAM. Stack. And then the English has the STACK program, the Redesign Program for the English uh, people. Uh, uh, the Academy for Professional Learning, uh, some design tech things, maybe some other things that, that, that aren't there. That went through a process. Okay, long story short, uh, the vast majority of that million dollars, for example, this past year, 900000 and change, was allocated for all of those innovation projects. To my knowledge, most of those projects are supported by faculty, uh, full-time faculty that have, been, that have been given release time to support those projects. That's probably the reason for the significant bump. And those salaries, and that, so and, and that was those budgeted. salaries are housed are being charged in it, the reassigned timeline item of yes, the budget. Yes, yes. In other words, we have these change of assignment forms, and so what it says is the percentages of the, the people that are on these lists that are assigned to those SASI projects are, are, are charged against that SASI line item. Uh, Just their staff. So what's well, so well, for the faculty? What what kinds of monies <coughs> are charged against that item? Is it uh, primarily sal salary? It's, I don't think we're charging benefits, okay. but we're charging salaries. And are the other expenses that are related to those projects in other line items of the budget? No. The, basically, yeah. uh, uh, each one of those project managers. Uh, this is all under the. Uh, the uh, um, oversight, if you will, of the Teaching and Learning Center and, and Dr. Brock Klein as the manager responsible. So each one of those projects have very specific budgets. And, and those budgets are for staff, supplies, conferences, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. So, uh, so, so they're managed in that regard. So that million dollars was allocated across all these SASI projects. Mm -hmm. And then the costs associated with those are either um, in this case, salaries are, are charged to that, or supplies, or, or whatever the items are. Do you think you could confirm that? Because you said you're not sure about that. So. Well, I, I, you know, I pr we probably could take a look at that and figure that out. But I'm I'm pretty confident. Now, to go back to Danny's question for a second, um, this district, um, I've come to find out over the years that I've been that I've been doing this work that this district is much more generous with release time and stipend time than many, many, many other districts out there. Uh, we provide release time and stipends to faculty to do work that many other districts say is within the scope of their contracts. 
but uh, we are very generous with that. And some of you who have been around for a long time might remember the, the stipend discussion and, and Dr. Kostler finally said, okay, if you're going to do this, we're going to cap the hourly rate for stipend work at $50 an hour, even though your hourly rate might be was higher that than that. Was that Dr. Kostler? I thought that was later. Who, Linda? I thought Who? it was later than that, but anyway. No, I, I'm pretty sure it was Dr. Kostler because I was the Associate Dean of Academic Support at the time and I was sort of right smack in the middle of it. Yeah, I mean, I remember that happening, yeah. but not. So anyway, so, so he said, okay, we're going to do it. We're going to cap it at $50 an hour. As far as I know, that is still the rate that we stick to on the stipend. But we're also very generous from a release time point of view in comparison to other districts. When I go around uh, other CBO meetings and we talk about this, this topic and I tell them the number of faculty that we have on release time, everybody's eyebrow is usually raised a little bit because it's, it, it's a pretty healthy number of release time faculty. So, it's, it, so it's, a, it's an institutional concern and it's one of the reasons why we are here talking about it at BRAC because it's a resource allocation decision uh, which has implications. We spend the million dollars on the innovation projects which are, uh, well, we, we, we release everybody for innovation projects and other things but then we have to backfill with adjuncts or overload to make up the fact that those people that were hired to teach are now being asked to do other things. <coughs> Important things, or else we wouldn't be doing them uh, most of the time, but still, they're not doing what they were, what, what they were asked to do. Yeah, that, that explains to me. I was wondering why the figures, the money figures seemed low to me. For instance, if somebody has 100% reassigned time, why is it only saving $40,000? I know their salary is higher, but we're talking about the cost of the adjuncts who go in in their place. Is no, which, which one are you talking about? Well, any of them, any of them. Like Bird this year, spring 2014, gets 100% release time, but it only saves $40,000. It's and one semester. It's one semester. Oh, one semester. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly. of course. Okay. I want you to know, John, I yeah. tripped on that the first time I looked you at the chart. Thank you did? Thank you. So don't feel like that. Don't feel like the Lone Ranger with okay. that Okay, okay. Uh, but, but that, but that, that's, that's that it. That makes sense. Um, okay, so I don't want to steal. Oh, right. one more the question, sir. Well, yeah. actually, I had a couple more questions. Oh, that's fine. I just want to let Dr. Bell. Dr. Bell, feel free to chime in here, too, well, if you want. But let, let's get Do Mary's question. Ahead, I don't want to interrupt you, but I have a 2.30, yeah, so I want to make sure. 3.30, right? Make sure I get okay. the answer. <laughs> yeah. uh, a, couple, a couple of things. When <laughs> I first looked at the, uh, the request to look at release time for faculty, it was done, again, when uh, Ed Martinez was the uh, Academic Center President. Then we were looking at how we could, in fact, absorb what was then that, that budget hit we had in January of 2012 where we had to cut back on the budget. So it was really viewed for more of how could we realize some budgetary savings. My contribution to these spreadsheets under the, under the uh, blue was really driven from a, uh, a discussion I was with in with uh, current president uh, Cairo when he mentioned, and I think aptly so, wouldn't the district be in a good position if many of the faculty who are now on release time were in fact back in the classroom teaching? I think that's a very sound comment. So began to look at it from the aspect of, okay, how many do we have in total? And then how could we go about making some kind of, uh, as it says here, recommended adjustment for considerations, okay? So that's how I went through the process. Uh, I want to be, since I'm on the record, let me see on the record, that these are just for consideration. These are not anything that we have done, and these are not suggestions of what we're going to do. These are possible ways that the district can go about looking at cutting back on the amount of release time we have and instituting some savings. Why I think it's important for BRAC is if we were, in fact, to do any or all of these, we would realize savings in what uh, Bob just described as 01, our general fund dollars. Those are general fund dollars which could then be allocated differently across the district to meet whatever the requirements were and demands from program review. So that's why I think it's important for BRAC. As BRAC picks up this discussion, we talk about it, it will also be parallel discussions that will be had among the academic deans and in the faculty and the schools about this because uh, we do have to best with the faculty. So as, as we move someone out of an assignment, for example, if a faculty member moves out of an assignment where they're each year here releasing back into the classroom and teach one, what happens to that work that they were doing? And two, does it stay? Does it fall the wayside of what we do? So that's a consideration as well. So I'm going to be clear again, these are all just potential adjustments. These are not at all set and concrete, nor have they been vetted at all with any of the faculty names who will be here. But that was the reason we went through it this time. And again, I think it's appropriate to look at uh, the requests that came from the current academics and the president to 
begin to answer the question, one, questions, one, wouldn't we be better served if those individuals who came to the college as full-time faculty members, wouldn't we be better served if they were in the classroom teaching and bringing that forward? And then two, um, how would we go about doing it? And the other thing I've discovered with release time is all of these engagements that both our instructional and non-instructional faculty are involved in for release time, all at some level underpin student success. So they aren't doing work which isn't important, they aren't doing work which is frivolous, it's all connects back to overall student success. So again, that's, that was the purpose of the, uh, the exercise in the blue, the names of the peer there, which led to Joe's recommendations of how the district could potentially realize some cost savings either in the 01 Juno Fund or OG grant areas. Yeah, now, Dr. Bell, just, uh, um, Dr. Bell used the recommendation word in terms of Joe's recommendations. If these, these are just, uh, as, as, we, as we label them here, as Dr. Bell mentioned, adjustments for consideration. Uh, we're not, as an administration, recommending that these reductions take place. Dr. That's Bell and I are very, very... If I use the word good. recommendation on, on, the, uh, on mm -hmm. the record, you can go and edit that out and put it with, uh, with uh, consideration. No, these are not recommendations from the administration or from my office for potential waivers of cut. These are some, some things which can be considered, and again, that's a discussion we'll be having with the faculty. Right. Regarding that, um, what was there some sort of criteria that you used to um, look at the to suggest or to um, the, 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 create this list? I, the, let me use a neutral term to yeah, create yeah, the list. That's a good idea. Uh, the criteria uh, to create the neutral list uh, was based upon uh, Dr. Bell's knowledge and my knowledge of of, of operations as we from our if you will, higher purchase, uh, understand them. Uh, it was just a, 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 a means by which to get the conversation started. Uh, I want to remind everybody that this uh, whole topic uh, first came to, just to began in 2010 when we were really looking at cost savings as a major need. But most recently, it was uh, generated by the Academic Senate and by, uh, uh, by uh, Professor Pallone specifically. Uh, to take to like to take a look at it, and so we thought it would be valuable to at least pr provide some kind of a potential starting point. The other thing that Dr. Bell said, and I want to hasten to say that this has not been vetted with any school deans, has been vetted with any faculty, has been vetted with anybody yet. Um, it's just it's just it's just a way to get the discussion off the table because we were asked to do that. Right. We were asked quite insistently to do that. And Mary Aaron, to, uh, to extend out a little further, uh, one of the other major views is there are some release time for faculty which are, we're contractually obligated to do. For example, the release time for faculty in the academic senate, uh, the faculty association. So as you go through this, you'll see those appear in the yellow and do not appear in the blue. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why. So any, any uh, release time for faculty which are, we're contractually obligated, we showed it as something which is on the books, if you will, but that's not anything that we're offering for consideration. So, so that was another thing. The, the, the one exception I just happened to see, we have Paul Jarrell down as a 20% FA negotiator. Well, now that he is uh, right. interim dean, we thought safe in pulling that one off, at least for now. Mm -hmm. So that was just an example of something mm -hmm. simple. Uh, would it be possible to, uh, because I think the increase in the uh, percentage of this budget item, what we've had the SASE grants for how long? About two years. Right. So, and this is what this is the current year. This is 13, 14, and a comparison of 14 uh, spring projected to 14, uh, 15, 15 or uh, to spring 15. If we if we did the exact same thing. So I don't. I think that it's pretty reasonable for the us to be looking at the entire period of SASE and even the year before. Well, if we, I guess I want to say this. Uh, we can show you, I think, what, what we did in 10-11. Uh, I mean, without actually showing it to you right now, we have pages of things that were done back in 2010 and whatever. Um, <coughs> other than this, the SASI bump, it's relatively consistent. Uh, back in those days, we, we, uh, um, we had uh, 
uh, perhaps more of the of the O3 funded Title V grant uh, release time amounts. Um, we had more and division coordinators. So that then. grant funding is under a different. It's under O3. Because that's okay. It's under O3. Um, so I get. I guess the point would be this. Uh, I'm not sure, we can do that. I'm not sure what it's going to, I'm not sure it's going to, I'm not sure what value it's going to inform our current reality. I don't, I don't know what it's going to do to change. Whatever that was, it was, it's money spent, it's done. Hopefully we got something good out of it. But, but the, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I'm not quite sure what the comparison is going to do. Joe's looking skeptical at me here. Well, so. uh, this is where we are today. Yeah. And so if we're looking at this, I'm not sure what the request was. What the, what the purpose of the request was, but if we're looking at the information from today and the potential for the future, I'm not sure what the benefit is of looking in the past. Um, and again, the amount of time that goes into putting this information together, I simply don't have. Well, so not only do back, you not have it, HR doesn't have yeah. it. So going back several years as And uh, remember, our data our, and our systems were not too great. Well, right now, the that. reason why it took so long is because it's a piece of paper in a file and somebody has to pull the file, create the spreadsheet, put the file back. We don't have a centralized system that captures this information. We will going forward. Is it, system. We will. Is it, I have, I'm sorry. Do you mind? Um, and I'm also curious about the looking forward because I think it's important to look at release time, but particularly because we're looking at the creation of department chairs. And my understanding is, and my folks in the FA can maybe inform me more, like we'd always talked about department chairs getting release time. So how do we plan for that moving forward? Oh, I know ESL has also already talked about who's going to be their department chair. Well, not and, exactly. That. Right, and how they're going to move forward with that, right? Well, and, and if I may, you're correct, but that's part of the discussion that we talk about uh, chairs and how those chairs begin to move in the world. Right. Much of that, in my opinion, is going to be a discussion that the, uh, the district has to have with the Palpa Association mm -hmm. on exactly how that does, how that vets out, what that would look like, and then how that would impact release time. So. Right. You're right. That's a discussion that has to be had, and it necessarily right. some level will impact these kind of numbers. And right. Which is why it's a broad topic. Mary, we keep yeah. cutting off here. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, you may or may not be aware, but the Academic Senate recently created a an ad hoc reassigned time committee to look into various issues and sort of looking at policies regarding reassigned time because um, it has become a hot button issue on campus. Um, and not with the intent of stopping reassigned time, but uh, cre really looking at creating something that's more feasible and, and workable for both faculty and the administration. Um, and that we, Manny Perea, who's the chair of the committee, Dr. Bell sent you last week an email requesting uh, information similar to this. Yep. He said, well, I sent it. No, I'm not saying he didn't. I haven't read it, so I have to go he back did. and check. I so check that email. I think he sent it uh, a week ago, Wednesday night. Okay, so you might want to look for that. Um, and really having that data, I think, would help the committee, and you know, and we can kind of come up with, from a faculty's perspective, what we think might be a workable policy uh, on reassigned time. And, um, having what data, though? The date, the data that's prior to this current year, right. I think, and I, I, I would like to go I, back I, I at least to the pre sassy I still don't understand what the comparative data is going to do to inform what we do going forward. But understanding where you came from, it's like studying mm -hmm. history. You what, you don't want to know the past. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't just. Again, I'm not trying to push this too much right now because I think we can have some discussions and find out how important it is because I now realize it's, it's a lot of resources but mm -hmm. but 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 understanding where we were before this because there's been a huge I mean th the reason it's a hot button issue is because there's been a huge increase in reassigned time over the last two or three years and so understanding where we were before yeah. and what the reassignment okay. was then would, would help you, you know, I, looking in the middle of it. Yeah, I totally hear where you're coming from. And I think, you know, Mary Erin, I'm so glad that you guys are looking into it because I think that you're also looking at like best practices, like at what other institutions, mm -hmm. right? Because like their honors program, they usually have two full-time faculty who are fully reassigned to run their honors programs, yeah. right? So maybe we definitely well, have people who aren't getting enough reassigned well, time, right? So, 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 right? so, so let, me, let, let me kind of be clear here, because I don't want to turn this into any kind of a, um, um, I don't want to turn this into any kind of a negative experience for all of us, because I think we're all trying to get to, the, to, yeah. to, to a better place. And I think 
one of the things I hear very clearly, Mary Erin, is uh, the manner in which uh, release time faculty have been selected uh, is a concern, and we probably should have some policies uh, associated with how, uh, how that ha happens. <coughs> That's one concern. The, the increase in the amount was another concern that and, and I he, had. I gasped mm -hmm. when I did that math, right. and I had other people check it since I'm an English teacher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so that's one concern. The second, the increase and the, the reason why the increase came together, and we can, we can figure out, probably tie that back to SASI, but we'll, we'll verify that for you. Um, and, um, you know, if in fact, if, if you guys just send me an email that basically says, this is, a, this is what we want and why we want it, and then Joe and I and Terry and HR will sit down and figure out okay. what we can do and, and over what timeline we can do, because okay. we're engaged in many, many other projects right now, including what we just had a presentation on, that we've got to gear up for that, and then we've got, we're, we're putting all the, uh, the new Lancer Point stuff in and a whole variety of things. And that's something I'm, that I was going to pull off of, which is that I know that for, as I was looking at the kind of projects that people are working on, this, some of the stuff is going on is based on program review, so for example, like, Chris is on reassign time to work on accreditation for graphic communication, right? Like, if she's working on something that's dedicated to her program, if that came as a recommendation from IEC, this is where maybe having that strategic planning and working on that rubric would allow us well, for that clarity of process. And there's another point that I, you know, it just, um, for, for pure transparency purposes, I, I'll say this. You know, the whole notion of SASI is to sort of um, innovate an idea, incubate the idea, and then if it works, to integrate or institutionalize the idea. So when you think of things like uh, MathPath, for example, uh, or uh, a good chunk of what is now the first year experience program, those were two examples of things that were innovated and incubated with mostly Title V money or, or federal money. but. Uh, because those things work, uh, Dr. Rocha and the board came up with this concept of the SASI. So we basically funded our own innovation. Instead of using soft money from the outside, grant money or federal, we basically invested in ourselves, which I think is the reason why we got this big boost. But we're at a point now where some of these things uh, might be uh, institutionalized. In other words, taken off of the quote unquote release time budget and be turned into ongoing allocations because they support the uh, board goals or the education master plan or both. That may also be one of the things that comes out of this is that, okay, if you don't do it this way, how are you going to do it? Well, we might just set up its own cost center, take some of that SASI dollar, for example, and say, not, not for that anymore, it's now going to be integrated in, into, into the budget. Um, and then if that happens, then it becomes part of the normal budgeting process. Bob, if I may, ladies and gentlemen, I have to leave. I have to get to a 3.30 appointment, so I apologize. And as the discussion goes, anything I need to contribute, some or all of you will let me know, and I will. And Mary, please tell me, I apologize. Okay. I either didn't see He's it. He's right across the hall from me. Blue so by it, or no even Bert, you get the belief. I will go and find it okay. and get back. And if the information request is all part of the greater effort that needs to be done through business services and HR to get it, I'll let many know that and we'll get the process going. So I apologize for that. And thanks for your time, everybody. So I think the, the last thing that I'll say uh, before the conversation continues is that we're willing to provide whatever information we need to that is actually going to get to the, to the challenge. And the challenge is um, we have seemingly more release time than perhaps we quote unquote should. And what are we going to do to deal with that? Or do we have exactly the amount of release time that we, that, that, that we need? And it's fine that we've got 33, whatever the percent, the number of faculty are on release time. Uh, if we can get some data from the past that somehow informs that discussion, whether it was 25, to, because let's just say it was 22, uh, you know, back three years ago, and now it's 33, right? Okay, that's fine. So are you, we might conclude, okay, 22 is our maximum. Well, you could conclude 22 is our maximum right now. You don't necessarily need to 
spend uh, 100 staff hours to figure that out. But, but, but seeing the specifics of what, what the release time was used for. I can is, tell you it's, it, it's very, very similar to this. But, but maybe we can do that. I've got some stuff from yeah. 10. Again, I, I'm not trying to. 10. I understand it's a lot of yeah. time, so I'm not. Yeah. Well, and I, I, just to, I hope I'm not overstepping, but I know that some of these are like specific negotiating issues, too. And I don't want us, I want us to focus on what's within our purview, which is the how do we get there so that our faculty association can advocate for what's the only best thing for faculty. The specific negotiating issue right now is the number of release, amount of release for seventh and FA. Otherwise, all of this is not a process. So here's, here's what I do have. Maybe this will be helpful, and I'd be happy to photocopy this right now. This was done on February 23rd of 2012. It's a release time out of HR for 2011. 2012. So here's a report. Yeah, I'll just give this to you. Here's a report uh, that was the, I guess this is really it right here. These are all the release times by faculty name and title and percentages for that period of time. And 11, for 11 12. And um, if I were to total it, it doesn't, this one's not totaled for some reason. Um, and then the work that was done by, um, it was 30, let's see. We had a chart here that said 29 faculty were involved and it said eliminate on this list. And that was a total of 6.7 FTE. And then we had um, 13 FTE, so it's 20 FTE that were on the, uh, the combination of need to review and the so-called eliminate. Um, so I'd be happy to share this with you. And it's got names, and it's got uh, release time title, and it's got the division they're from, and it has um, uh, percentages of release time. It has uh, an annual salary column, which will probably, if I can find it, we should just take that out, because I don't think people need to know that information. Uh, I mean, I'd be happy to give you this. And at that point, at that point, somebody did some work. I can't tell you it's completely complete, but I can tell you that it, it, it's what we've got. Mm -hmm. And 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 I and I well, think and if we have more questions and we feel like we need more information and you Dr. Bell can look at the letter, the email right. from Manny, um, we can further discuss it. Right. Um, I'm not trying to hide anything. Start. Yeah. And, and We're not, I, I know, okay. I'm not suggesting yeah. that. No. I know that, but my point is this is this is this is very very full yeah. disclosure no, I understand. Um, on what's no, going on here. It. Yeah, and uh, so we're happy to do that. But what I'm just very very reticent to do is agree to a, a great deal of additional staff time uh, because it probably would involve four or five people, many 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 hours to try to go back. And remember. It isn't until we, we, we put the Lancer Point system into effect that we've even got the ability to accurately count the widgets the way they need to be isn't counted. Isn't the release time on the monthly payroll sheet? Uh, the, go ahead, yeah. I Actually, I thought of that while we were talking. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go back and ask, because there's a, a report that we can pull. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can, then yeah. 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 I mean, but I, mean, I, I don't know. I, I assumed that this data okay. was maybe a little more readily available and I thought it was on the monthly payroll. Well, it should be. And it will be going forward. I believe it is. Actually. On the payroll report. Yeah. Maybe it is on the payroll. Yeah. Yeah, I'll check. Yeah. Okay. And if it's there, you can have it. Okay. Although, check some privacy issues. But again, yeah. it's all. Well, yeah, actually, but, yeah, but I think a payroll report would probably have. Yeah, social security we, numbers. Yeah, exactly. We've got to deal with the I, privacy I issues, understand. so we'd have to cleanse that a little bit. But uh, the other thing about salaries in general, it's a public institution, so we have we have an obligation to share that everybody. Mr. Foster. I'm sorry to interrupt. Just a quick observation. You know, uh, globally, one of the things that we're dealing with as an institution right now is the proportion of full-time faculty to adjunct faculty. And, you know, I, and I know it's almost a laughable rule now, but the 75% rule. And as I look at this just on the surface, you know, one thing that tells me 
is that we're probably over-reporting our full-time faculty in the classroom by 10%. Yeah. Well, what what, what uh, Dr. Foster is reporting or uh, re referring to is the full-time faculty obligation number FFON that we have an obligation to report to the state every year, and the formula actually uh, doesn't include a, a a category for release time. What they want to know is your full-time faculty, and of course we define full-time faculty as classroom faculty, librarians, counselors. Uh, so teaching and non-teaching faculty. So we, we report them in aggregate. And I believe it's 379 point something uh, full-time faculty that we report. Um, it is roughly 30 over what our current obligation is right now. Uh, but surprise, but, but, um, but, but that is what that is. But I think you're right. If, if you looked at 33 against that number, you're roughly at 10 percent of, of our faculty that are not in the classroom teaching. Now, to be fair, some of those wouldn't be anyway because some people on this list are counselors and, and, and what have you. Uh, but that is an accurate statement. And in their office hours meeting with students, there's all this. That, you know, right. Yeah, you know. exactly. But, you know, on you the other hand, a, there are worthwhile things there, to there you go. come out that, of that, That's so, absolutely, you know. that's a very, very important thing to bear in mind. Okay, so, um, I'll work, Joe will work on the payroll piece to see if he can uh, sanitize something that goes back a year or two or three. Um, Do you I'll, want to give me that report? I'll ask Cindy if you don't mind okay. to, because uh, there's a couple of columns in there I want to pull out that's got some salary stuff. Okay. Um, for just for individual people's privacy. Uh, but then I'll ask Cindy to get your photocopy of, of that no. stuff very quickly, but, you know, by, within a day or two, or by tomorrow. Uh, okay, is there anything else? on this discussion and everybody needs to know that this will be posted on on the on the BRAC web website I mentioned that okay. so everybody will know it's there because we have an obligation uh, to do that thank you okay so uh, this goes till four so we've got some time I'm going to run through some of these things um, relatively quickly So the next item in your, in your packet uh, is uh, something that's called uh, uh, CEO Briefing uh, State Budget and Fiscal Issues. And what this uh, three-page document is, is an overview of information that was provided to the CEOs at the last uh, consultation uh, meeting that they had. and. Um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, express to you is the first item talks about the first principal portion. <coughs> uh, our district is on track for a revenue and expense. Uh, on expense, it's right on track. On revenue, we were three and a half million behind due to the redevelopment agency funding issues that, that the state is dealing with. Long story endless here, at the end of the P1, uh, which is payment one, or period one of, of, of four periods, uh, we're tracking at the moment about 1.2 million short of the revenue that we were supposed to get this year at the moment. Uh, now there's a long way to go between now and June 30th. Uh, and in fact, uh, it may be that we do better than the revenue that was promised to us for a variety of things that would take too long to explain to everybody. But right now, we're looking at about a $1.2 million, quote unquote, shortfall to our income uh, based upon uh, some of the issues that are going on in the state. Now, uh, but again, I hasten to say that that's, that's as of, uh, you know, February 18th, 20th, whatever the date was, and there's, plenty, there's, there's a lot of more time um, in the game to be played. Uh, then you see the next paragraph, which says, Work Group on Fiscal Affairs. And the uh, chancellor's office has convened, uh, convened a meeting of its staff, uh, the California Community College League, uh, and the community college finance groups, including the um, Association of Chief Business Officers, to try and figure out formulas uh, to um, allocate the new access dollars. At the last meeting, you might recall, we talked about all of the, the way the budget, the governor's budget laid out. And we talked about uh, the 3% growth monies, which represented $2.5 million. 
uh, to PCC. Uh, the challenge with that is, is that in, 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 in the way the business has been run for many, many years, if a district achieved that additional FTS, no matter how they achieved it, uh, you got the money. Now, they are creating um, a detailed set of rubrics. And if you go to uh, the attachment that's got, that says digest on the top, and which is actually the next, the growth funding metrics on the, on the agenda next, you'll see that there is a very complex set of metrics being developed tied to what, what, you know, what we all know as student success, equity, service, and efficiency. And without getting into all the details of this right now, what it basically means is that in order to receive the growth funding, you have to attain the metrics or the goals that are established here in support of student success, equity, service, and efficiency, as defined by all of these uh, folks uh, up there in, 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 the, in Sacramento. Now, can I interrupt real quick? Yeah. Just a technical question. Mm -hmm. Why are the years so? I was on the website today myself looking at our scorecard, and yeah. I couldn't figure out when I, I can find the 12 data, and then I get this five year cohort. Yeah. What happened between 7 and 12? Where's that data? It's the ARC. It was mm -hmm. under a different name. Yeah. It's the it accountability. Used to be ARC, uh, and it changed. Yeah. First, that would be a really good question. That, that was not <laughs> our <laughs> campus <laughs> change, it was a yeah. state change. Right. No, yeah, yeah. 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 So that's state, why. I'm trying to and, find okay. the data. Yeah, yeah. And it's because it's, it's they changed the name. Okay. If that's why you got, if you were using the last right. two years, that's beginning of last year was when they changed that data. Part, part of our challenge. the student success task team recommendations. Right. Part of our challenge, uh, and if Crystal were here, Marie was here, Joe was here, I'm here. You go to that website, the Chancellor's Office website, and I'm telling you, it's a challenge, right? <laughs> it is a challenge and a half. You need and a PhD to get through that one. <laughs> I think you need a couple of PhDs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've already got one. Find the data. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, what they're about to do is make our lives even simpler, <laughs> ha, 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 by creating all these additional metrics to measure specific growth, purportedly tied to uh, basic skills, uh, accomplishment, more de degrees, accomplishments, and transfers and certificates, okay? But most specifically, only as it relates to the specific needs of the service area that your particular district supports. And most specifically, as it relates to the needs of unemployed, the, the, the types of, of, of employment that your area requires, and are you servicing that, that level of employment? For example, if, if you've got a widget factory in your backyard and you're not teaching anything to, to provide employees to that widget factory, but you're teaching people things to, that, 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 that are not needed in your area or not needed in your state, then they're going to say, well, we're not going to give you the growth funding because you're not funding, you're not providing services in the areas that are needed. Okay? Now. And these people, the chief business officials in the chancellor's office, are going to create these metrics? What's happening is the chancellor's office, the Department of Finance, and CBO groups, they're all trying to get together. Now, this, now, now what's happening is, is that the district people are screaming bloody murder for various reasons. One, no one, it is not feasible at this point in time to build the schedule or even to build the programs needed to fulfill what is needed, certainly by July 1 of 2015. So Dan Troy uh, and uh, uh, Dan Troy is the Vice Chancellor of Fiscal Affairs and Bryce Harris, who is our, our Chancellor, they are working with the Department of Finance, Governor Brown, saying at least hold off another year. Give the system time to figure out a better way to do this than this stuff. And, and, and give us some breathing room on that. That may or may not happen, okay? Now, we'll know a little bit more about that once we get to the May Revise and a few other things, but, but it's, it, it, it's, it's very dicey right now. Has the Senate, the State Academic Senate, joined forces with them? Do you know yes, that? the State, well, I, I don't know for a fact, but I'm relatively confident that, uh, that they are engaged like in this conversation in some form or fashion, too. It started to create, like, a subcommittee that was working specifically on some of this stuff. Unfortunately, this stuff's moving like light speed. This is uh, Brown, uh, Governor Brown is on a mission, and uh, many of the legislators are on, the, are on a similar mission to change. 
of all the new revenue that's in the state right now, the increased taxes, Prop 30, what have you, 90% of that new revenue is going to K-12 through higher education, 90%. So as you walk the halls of Sacramento, you can imagine all the other lobbyists for all the other special interests, all the other social services, all the other, lining up saying, where's ours, where's ours, where's ours? So the, so the point is, is they're saying and that we have to be able to prove, we being community colleges, CSU, UC, K-12, we have to be able to prove that all that additional money is actually doing something. And so we've got a, maybe a two or three year window to make that case before they're going to say, well, we've got to go to somebody else because of what happened. So this, it goes beyond accountability now. Um, this is also the first step of, of, of performance-based funding. This is, this, is, this is opening the door, getting the Campbell's nose into the can and can basically saying, and this is Carol Liu, you know, you know, Senator Liu, basically saying, we're only going to pay on completion. We're only going to pay on, you know, we're not going to pay on uh, students finding themselves or changing majors or whatever. We're going to pay on purely moving people through the basic skill sequence, uh, certificates, degrees, uh, transfers, and, um, and uh, uh, yeah, and transfers. Now, the reason why I stumbled on transfers is there's, there isn't even language in here that even speaks to transfers. And what, 50%, 60% of what we do is transfer oriented? So, to answer the question specifically, CEOs, chief business officers, chief instructional officers, chief student service officers, everybody is saying, slow down. Uh, and let's see if we can approach this on a more rational level. Okay? But be that what it all is, um, what I want to report to, to Brack is that even though we have Prop 30, we have uh, Prop 98, we have stable funding, what we really got out of all that is stability. Okay? We didn't get a whole lot more money, but we didn't get less money. We got, we got, we got stability, so we don't have to keep borrowing or shifting around or, or what have you uh, in order to just try to just make payroll and, and pay the bills. That's what we got out of Prop 30, which is great, which means that we've got some stability for, I think, through 16, 17, or maybe 17, 18, for the other half of it, whatever the years are. That's the good news. But as far as exactly how much we're going to get, this is still the best guess estimate. Uh, we would get potentially $3.4 million of additional revenue, assuming we were able to jump through this $2.5 million. In other words, the COLA is only 0.86%, or 0.86%, right. 0.86%. Uh, that's $875,000. That's our growth money, or our COLA money. Our growth money, if we got it all, is $2.5 million. That's $3.4 million. We also have $1.9 million coming to us for student success. And again, this is based on the governor's budget, so who knows what will happen. But only if, we, only if we follow very specific guidelines, which we can do. Student equity plans, if we, do, if we create a student equity plan that's tied to certain student success task force recommendations, that's another $1.9 million. Uh, deferred maintenance, 1.65 million, but that requires a a one-to-one -one match. Uh, instructional equipment, 1.65 million, but that requires a one-to-three match. Uh, and then deferral income and in, in, in a couple of other categories here. Uh, if we got all of that, that could bring us up to about 12 million dollars if we if everything worked of, of, of additional revenue. And then there might be a payment, uh, we'll see how it goes, of, of almost $12 million of one-time cash bringing us, bringing us and every other district in the state completely whole on all the deferred monies that they, were, that they were supposed to pay us in the last five years, I think it is. But that's, that's one-time cash, comes in once, used for whatever we're going to use it for, but it's not something that we can count as recurring, so therefore we have to be careful what we spend it on, because if we spend it on benefits or salaries or what have you, we don't have new cash coming in every year to back that up. So that's kind of where we are right now, and uh, i just go through, you can read all these things, if you have any questions, call somebody else, because <laughs> uh, it'll drive you nuts. Okay, so that's kind of where we are, and... Um, Seven minutes. And uh, so uh, the other thing is, um, 
we did we did report all of not 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 what I just reported to you guys on the metrics and everything, but we did at the February 19th board study session uh, did provide a pretty detailed piece of information, which is on the web regarding our budget situation in, in this budget report, uh, and it's up there under the February 19th um, uh, board packet material. So you're welcome to go look at that. If you have any further questions, we'd be happy to, to speak to those. Okay, any any comments or questions on my rambling? <coughs> okay, so as far as attachments are concerned, some, we, we are part of uh, uh, School Services of California, and uh, this is a 30, 40 year uh, institution that basically provides uh, support services to uh, uh, K-12s in California Community College. And they provide uh, uh, daily what they call community college updates. So uh, I look at them daily, and the ones that I think might be interesting to BRAC, I, I just kind of grab offline and ask Cindy to make copies. Uh, this first one looking at here is the statewide average ending fund balances for 12-13. Uh, and it just kind of gives you information as to what the percentages were. Uh, we are roughly 12% plus, we're roughly 17 or 18% is what we typically are. And you'll see that the average statewide happens to be 16.61%. Uh, and you see the lowest and the highest. So that, it, and there's, there's district out there that's got 35.53%. Um, that's a pretty big number. So wouldn't you like to be negotiating with that? Well, it could be a small district, right? All right. The next one is the Assembly Committee examines CalSTRS unfunded liability. The reason why I printed that out, and that's pretty, it's a pretty lengthy document for these updates, is it's a pretty good primer on what's happening with CalSTRS and the impact that this is going to have um, on community colleges down the road where very likely for both PERS and STRS there's going to be increases in employer contributions and probably significant increases. So this is a nice little overview of what's going on with that. Uh, and then CalPERS, for those of you who are CalPERS retiree, and I'm one of them, um, there's uh, uh, their demographic assumptions and, and uh, uh, interesting information about uh, uh, what the rate of increase is going to be for uh, employer contributions. And what this is saying is that local governments could see costs rise up to 5% of payroll for average state employees and up to 9% of payroll for safety classifications in year five of the phase in. So they're basically saying that for me, 5% of my, whatever, I think we pay 7%, 7 or 8% now for CalPERS, every CalPERS employee. This is basically telling us that we're, they're gonna be charging us 12%, but it's gonna phase in, the extra 5% is gonna phase in over the next five years. So we know that these are costs coming. Mm -hmm. And for our public safety employees, in our case it would be for our, our police uh, department folks, they're going to go up 9%. It's a relatively small force so it, that we can absorb. So that's just that. Now, CalSTRS is, um, is, is controlled by the legislature, so that's a different topic. So that whatever happens with them will be the legislative. But CalPERS is an independent board and they can make their own, their own determinations. The next one is just the continued good news. January revenues are tracking uh, the forecast, and I won't get into the detail of it, but basically state revenue continues to be on track. We're healthy. Things are coming along. That's good news. Uh, the next one talks about deficits in our, in our apportionments and what those deficit factors are. It was projected to be 4%. It is 4% at the P1, which means 4% of the income that was supposed to come to us is not going to come to us as of this writing, as of March 7th, 2014. Uh, doesn't mean that that's going to be the end of the story. In fact, I'd be surprised if it was. Okay? Uh, but that's our deficit factor right now. And it gives you a history of what, it, of, of what it's looked at over the, over the last uh, six or seven years. And there's a nice little primer on that as well. Um, and then this is actually very good news, this last one. Bill to place an education facilities bond measure on the ballot has been introduced. We are all aware of the Serapian building, the U building, and the fact that it's been vacant now two and a half years? Two years? Two and a half years? Um, 
as, as I think I've reported, I know I've reported, uh, the state has approved what's known as a final project plan that would give us $54 million to replace that building. Uh, it's a category A3 building, which means it's, it, 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 uh, uh, they certified that yes, the building in a six point or whatever it is, earthquake, it would pancake, it will fall down, it's not safe, you can't use it. So the state says that we are very high in the priority list and we're probably among the top ten projects. The problem is the state doesn't have any money to fund any of the educational facilities. So there is a uh, facilities bond measure that uh, there's one legislator in particular Joan Buchanan, who is fighting hard to get that on this year's ballot. Uh, the talk is, is that it's, it's slim, it's not, not a good chance that's going to happen. She believes strongly it will happen. So I think she wants to trade bullet train money or water bond money or something with, uh, with, with Brown to try to get this on the, on the ballot. If, and, and then it would require all of us taxpaying uh, you know, citizens of the state of California to approve it. If that happens, we would get uh, fifty-four million dollars to uh, to, put, uh, to rebuild uh, the U building. Uh, so that's just what that's about. And if it doesn't happen this year, it more than likely will happen in the next couple of three years. Okay, that's a lot of talking. I missed you enough. What did I miss again? You know, what's on you enough? Uh, budget development rollout. Oh. Seven minutes. Don't have time for that. Joe, what would you like to say? One so, minute. In one minute. I can do it. Okay. Actually, something that's not on the agenda. Last time we met, you asked for a list of everybody who's on the benefits committee, so I just wanted to provide that so you have it. Uh, the budget development rollout next week is um, fiscal's training on the new component in Lancer Point, the new fiscal, fiscal module. We actually are being trained on how to do budget development in Lancer Point, so I'll provide an update next month on how that goes. Um, one thing, I think it was in December or November that we actually did a walkthrough of the budget de documents that we developed. Um, the timeline that uh, Crystal and Stephanie talked about today in their presentation was a part of that package. I kind of pulled back instead of implementing it as a whole district uh, across the district. I think what we're going to do is roll it out and ask for uh, volunteers. So it's a rollout project. Uh, related to the building of the new budget to make sure that the documents that we're putting in place actually do make sense instead of us just applying it across the board. Um, but more information next month with the Lancer Point update. And then uh, last month, I was, or last time we met, I was also asked to report back on the SERP and how much money it was going to save the district. So just quickly, uh, just so you know, there are 19 employees who are taking advantage of the SERP. The five-year payout for the district is approximately $1.7 million, or $1,675,000. No, excuse me. So 19 employees took advantage of the CERT. Currently, the district pays $1,675,000 in salary to those employees. 75% of the final pay benefit over the five years through for the CERT is $1,316,000, which means that there's a savings to the district of $359,000. So the answer to the question last time was, what is the savings? Yes. It's $360,000. Right. Now, what's important... Per year for five years. Uh, for the five-year period, it's a savings of $360,000. For five years. Overall. Yes. Savings. For 19, for 19 employees, uh, and of course those employees are, I think it was one or two managers and the rest are, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four, four managers. five managers, and uh, 14 uh, classified staff. Um, I'm sorry, uh, can so I just that's say? that's 1,600,000 that we pay over five years for those folks' salaries? No, no per, year. per year. So Annual. that's a savings. Yeah. Three hundred thousand a year over five years. That's correct. Correct. That's okay. correct. It's not not no, I'm sorry. No, no, correct. No. <laughs> That's my fault. But in your mind, it was the right thing over five, five years. years. <laughs> but also, uh, <laughs> what I do want to say is that that does not include the savings that we would have in in uh, benefits benefits as well, which is probably seventy percent or so. Now, but I want to add because it's really important. I don't want anybody to leave this room thinking that we're not going to backfill some of those positions or not going to use that money to, to move around and I earlier early in the when we were talking about SERPs way back when I created this little pie chart thing and there's in my mind there's four reasons why we need SERPs right uh, one is the salary and the benefit savings we've just kind of talked about that 
The second is change management, and back in those days we were talking about enterprise resource plans and what all that was going to mean. Now we call it administrative information system. And, and, and how we would have to bring in folks who were more used to using that kind of technology or we would be restructuring in such a way that we would uh, require um, different skill sets in different areas and different knowledge and that would give us a chance to refresh the uh, employee base in that regard. Uh, we were talking about reorganization and how we might save a few bucks that way. I'm not sure that that actually happened or not. But most importantly on this chart is to help improve faculty and staff diversity. Because the retirements allow us to, to rehire and then to look at our diversity and our EEO plans. And we, we, our EEO plan was approved last night by the board in a very interesting discussion if some of you were there. Um, but that's something that this district um, continues to be challenged by. So SERPs are not just about saving money, they're about you know, institutional change and institutional effectiveness and all that kind of stuff. But be that as it may, the, the, the numbers are, are pretty, uh, pretty um, straightforward in that regard. Okay. Can I just ask a quick question on, the, on the, those numbers, Joe? Right. Sure. Okay, so you said the current salary for the employees, the 19 employees that are taking the service, is 1.675 million. Correct. And the payout over five years is 1.3 Six. Right. Okay. So the savings of three hundred fifty nine thousand. That, that's. I mean, if you paid it all out in one year compared to one year salary. So are you then including in this the cost of replacing those people? No, I no. think okay. you're right. So you're so right. if over five years you would have paid one point six seven five million, you're you're getting close to eight or nine million, and you're only paying out one point three six million. So you're right. Yeah. Savings is about. I will give you a new yeah. number oh. next month. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right. No, it's a, it's a good You're point, right. Dan. Uh, and, I, and we appreciate that. Um, but I always like to say SERPs are about money, but they're not only about money. And that's, that's the most important thing. Now, it's still on the. It's still. I don't know if it's still available for faculty or not. I don't know what's going on with that. But uh, really, the SERPs uh, pay off uh, more when faculty are involved. Uh, I think the faculty would be very interested in that. We hope to talk to them tomorrow. But exactly. They seem to want to tie it to other things. I know. Well, I, I don't want to go there, but what I do <laughs> want to say is, is that is that SERPs are designed more for faculty. Which, by the way, without getting too involved right now, um, I wish I had it in front of me. The EEO plan was interesting, and one of the things that it basically said is we have roughly 1,100 faculty positions that we support, and roughly another 400 or 500 600 maybe, no, 400 or 500 of other positions. So no matter how you cut it, faculty are the reason why these institutions exist, and mm -hmm. teaching and learning is why these institutions exist. You're kidding. And every day, <laughs> every day, I, 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 I announce that to the world. So so we get that and, and, and respect that, and obviously we can support it. Have All right. Met? So I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Is there time for somebody to still get on here? Yeah, of course, anytime. So just to answer the question, it is 1.675 million a year. It's 263,000 that we uh, that we pay for the five year, or per year for the five years. So it looks like over the five years, it's a $7 million savings if we did not backfill any of those yeah. positions. Okay. I'm sorry, okay. that was sorry. the right answer. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, anything else for the good of the order? Our next meeting. Our next meeting, according to this, is uh, April 24th, hmm. May 29th, and June 19th. I may be on the hiring committee April 24th. I'll let you know. Okay. Obviously, continue without me, then you'll come in. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you.